Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. I'm Tom McKenzie. Let's check in on your markets then on Labor Day holiday, of course, in the US with US futures pointing to some upside. And there is optimism here in Europe as well, halting three straight days of losses across European equities. China is certainly a theme today with the concrete measures coming through, particularly in terms of real estate, property prices and in terms of easing your ability to buy and purchase homes in major cities like Beijing and Shanghai. We saw the impact of that over the weekend and that has lifted sentiment in Asia and that feed through crumbs across to the European session. Across the benchmark then, 459 on the European stock 600, up three tenths of a percent. And across your sectors, just flagging that travel and leisure's top of the list, gaining a full 1%. Bottom list, utilities, down four tenths of a percent. Futures, as I mentioned, in the US, of course, closed in terms of the market trading session today, but futures pointing to add to gains of last week. Last week, the best week for US stocks and US equities since June. S&P just pointing up futures by just a tenth of a percent. Euro dollar 107, so the single currency getting two tenths of a percent. The debate amongst senior officials, amongst the ECB, remains very prominent and the divisions remain acute as well. We hear from the dovish Centino, Mario Centino, saying that we need to be aware of the risks of higher rates in this environment. The weakness, of course, of the Eurozone economy has been underscored in the last few weeks, particularly with PMI out of countries like Germany. 107 on euro dollar. We look ahead, of course, to the ECB decision on September the 14th. Brent crude, really interesting to track oil prices, at least since the end of June, where you've seen a 20-plus rally for Brent. It's kind of sneaked up on us, this one. $88 a barrel and expectations from traders that the Saudis will extend their cuts as part of OPEC plus of course into October so how that plays into the inflation debate as well remains consequential so we keep an eye on the oil space let's get back to the markets though or stay on the markets to get more detail more analysis with Bob Eddie unlimited fund CEO and CIO joining me now and Bob I just want to cast our eye back to the jobs data out of the US on Friday. One interpretation of it was this was a Goldilocks job sprint in terms of where the Fed is standing. You're starting to see cracks in a US labor market that has remained so resilient for so long. Talk to us about what stood out to you. Well, I think if we look at the holistic set of labor market data that's out there, uh, we're starting to see that moderation in a bunch of different places. Uh, of course, the headline numbers have come down. We're adding only uh, just over 100,000 100, jobs a month, particularly when you take into consideration revisions. But you're also starting to see weakness in other areas, leading areas like the Challenger Job Cut Survey, which showed you know basically back to highs for the year. Uh, you also are seeing it in the Jolt Survey, where basically every measure that you're looking at is starting to soften there. And in ADP, which was also uh, a bit soft. And so you add that all up together, we definitely have a downward momentum that's beginning in the labor market. And the, the trouble is once you start to get that downward momentum, that weakening, uh, those are the sorts of things that are typically self-reinforcing. So we might be right at that turn. It's It's been a long 18 months of strength, uh, but we might yeah. be starting to see the beginning of that weakness. And maybe this is the tip of the iceberg when it when it comes to this jobs market. What does that what does the read across then for the Fed, Bob? Is it enough in terms of the weakness that you've started to, to, to see and you've identified for the Fed to, to, to pause and have confidence in that pause? Well, I think the Fed is going to pause pretty much no matter what they've they've outlined that uh, they're waiting to see, given the magnitude of their hikes, what, you know, how exactly that's flowing through now just because they're pausing doesn't mean that it isn't an effective tightening because priced into the markets in 2024 are a bunch of cuts. So to the extent that the Fed mm -hmm. just takes it easy, stays level, and those cuts start getting priced out, that's actually an effective tightening that's going on. I think that's probably what we're going to see, a wait-and-see approach from the Fed, because while we are seeing some weak weakening in the labor market, it's still secularly strong, and those wages are still elevated. Right, the wage inflation is still elevated, and that's a particular concern for the Fed when it comes to thinking about structural inflation pressures in the economy. There was a line coming through from UBS's Mark Cofaley on, on the prospects of a softish, softish landing for the U.S. economy. You're not in that camp, Bob. You think it's going to be slightly more painful uh, for the U.S. economy. Just expand on why the calls around a soft landing may be misconstrued at this point. 
Well, I think if you look at the markets right now, the markets are all in on a soft landing. You have equities that are pricing at a 12% earnings growth next year. You've got uh, cuts being modest cuts being priced in, expecting the Fed to ease in response to moderating inflation. And so markets are all in on soft landing. The reality is that it's very, very difficult to achieve a soft landing, not impossible, but very difficult. And particularly when you start to get that downward momentum that's going on. And, and with a Fed, you know, th this dynamic today is very different than, you know, cycles, uh, earlier cycles where the Fed could cut immediately at the first sign of softening growth. Here, we've still got that inflation pressure. Wages are still growing at five to six percent on a matched basis. That's too high relative to productivity growth at zero. And so what's probably going to happen is as we start to see this weakening of the economy, the Fed is not going to ease like many people expect. And so that's going to make it very hard to achieve that soft landing, certainly harder than essentially the 100% uh, probability of a soft landing that's currently priced in. So, so where does this where does this relative caution, Bob, take you in, ter in terms of positioning? Are you taking money out of out of the tech stocks, uh, out of the Nasdaq? Are you are you positioning into into safe havens? W what is your positioning bias weighing up all well, this macro got, data? Yeah, I think you've got to look when you particularly when you're going into the equity market. First of all. Stocks, the S&P 500 is pricing in 12% earnings growth. The bond market is pricing in cuts. Those are inconsistent. Probably both are too, uh, too elevated right now. Uh, odds are uh, we're going to see uh, less earnings growth than what's priced into the equity market and fewer cuts that are priced into the short end of the market. Um, but I think then when you go under the hood and look at the equity sectors, you've got to start to look at you know what what the pricing looks like relative to the responsiveness of a weakening economy and you've got you know high flying tech stocks that are pricing in near perfection in terms of outcomes uh those are the sorts of areas that are probably going to be most sensitive to a bit of a weakening in the economy we've started to see that a little bit and then you compare that to other areas for instance in the commodity complex and 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 uh oil related stocks and materials related stocks where they're pricing in essentially a terrible outcome when uh, when the those markets are starting to tighten up a little bit and we're starting to see upward pressure on in the materials complex and in oil. And that's further exac exacerbated by the fact that, you know, if China comes online, that will be even further supportive to those stocks. So you've got real dispersion in terms of both the pricing and the underlying fundamental momentum. Where is your regional focus, Bob, at this point? I think it's got to be outside the U.S. You know, there's 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 no value left in the U.S. Uh, you know, you're seeing stocks priced to perfection in a late cycle uh, period with tightening and elevated inflation, and that almost always aligns with a very uh, a weak outlook for stocks. Uh, you compare that to other areas of the world, uh, particularly the emerging markets, which are already in easing cycles. Many emerging markets are in the easing cycles plus. Those economies that are closer to the U.S. are benefiting from the friend shoring dynamic uh, or the near shoring dynamic. And so those economies, uh, those stock markets look more attractive, uh, say, Latin American stocks. And then even, you know, even if you look at a place like China now, I think there's some ambiguity about whether or not uh, this this is the set of policies necessary to reopen the economy. Mm. But regardless uh, a terrible outcome is priced into Chinese equity markets. And so even a moderately good outcome uh, and some stimulation from here is probably beneficial to those markets. Really, really interesting. Yeah, there's been a lot of bad news priced into, into Chinese stocks. U.S. stocks looking like they're priced to perfection, maybe looking uh, to EM and LATAM as an opportunity. Bob Elliott, the calls there coming through from Unlimited Funds, CEO and CIO. Really appreciate it. Go enjoy your Labor Day. Go and enjoy uh, those hot dogs. Thank you for the analysis and the insight. Coming up, talking of oil, oil heading steady and near its highest level since November. More on what's driving the bullish activity in the oil market. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets. I'm Tom McKenzie here in London and European HQ. Oil, meanwhile, 
uh, of course, steadying close to its highest level. Just checking in on Brent right now, trading at $88.59. Uh, uh, flat in the session so far, WTI at $85. This, of course, all since November on expectations that OPEC Plus leaders will keep tightening the market. We had the news, of course, last week around Russia and its, its extension uh, of cuts. Bloomberg senior executive editor, editor for energy and commodities, Will Kennedy, uh, joins me now. Will, there is an expectation amongst traders within the oil space that the Saudis will also extend their output cuts until October. What is the thinking behind that? Why is there this confidence that the Saudis are going to go ahead with further restrictions in terms of output? Uh, because I think that uh, OPEC Plus is determined to uh, assert its uh, control over the market, mm. um, that they feel that there are reasons why uh, there's been a little bit of concern about prices, uh, uncertainty about the Chinese economy, more oil coming out of Iran, um, for example. Um, so both on the demand and the supply stuff, there are reasons why they want to keep control of the market. And I think most traders expect that Saudi Arabia will want to probably do another month. They say that they don't target a price, but we're closing on $90 a barrel. Is that the kind of level that would maybe compel, if it's held there or around that level for a sustained period of time, that would compel the Saudis to think about relaxing output? What is the level that gets the Saudis back into this market? I'm not sure what the precise level is, and as you say, they don't tend to ever talk directly about price. Uh, I think that if you look at the Saudi budget, they probably want something closer to uh, above $90 rather than below 70 but that's a fairly obvious thing, to, uh, obvious thing to say. I think what they do want is to make sure that the market isn't uh, oversupplied and that we get prices fall back from here. I think they want to feel confident uh, that the market is better balanced and they can put those million barrels back into the market without seeing prices fall away. Is, is all the headline negativity around China distracting from the fact that actually Chinese demand is holding up relatively well? How are you reading the Chinese Well, demand? I think that's been very interesting because uh, there's a big oil conference happening in Singapore this week. It's called APEC. It's where all Asia's oil traders get together to talk about the market, the year ahead to do deals. Mm. Uh, and what we're seeing from there is people are saying, yes, so there are clearly issues in the Chinese economy, especially in the property sector. But from what we can see, demand for crude oil is holding up very well. And I think that reflects uh, both the sort of different aspects of the uh, Chinese economy and that a lot of gasoline demand, for example, is consumer led. And also that China has built a lot of refining capacity and is taking crude oil to uh, refine it and export it. So there is a degree of perhaps slightly surprising optimism from people at the centre of the oil trade about the strength of the Chinese demand. The US and shale, is there any sense that shale, US shale, is going to be an increasing factor in the next six to 12 months as prices push slightly higher? Are we, are, are we at more of a tipping point? They complain about labour shortages, but there is this lack of, of capex. Is that, is that starting to change? Anything material when it comes to US shale? Well, I mean, I think the story of this year is that people have said that the shell industry is tough and they're concentrated on returns um, and that it's not the business it used to be. But when all said and done, output has continued to rise through the year and it has put more oil into the market. I think people will be interested to see how that develops, particularly, as you say, in a higher price environment, when perhaps that will drive people to push production a little bit. But the key question is how much it slows and flattens off going into next year, which is what people will look like, because it's clearly been part of the supply story this year. People will want to know what, what sort of role it's going to play in uh, 2024. Okay, Will Kennedy, thank you very much indeed for breaking down the latest trends across these oil markets. Executive editor, of course, for oil and energy, currently trekking in on Brent, $86, $88, uh, 62 just a gain of a tenth of a percent. WTI at $85 a barrel. Still ahead, Apple embraces new technology it did not want. The change will come with the new iPhone 15. The details are next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets. We are about a week away from Apple's annual product upgrade event. It will unveil the iPhone 15, which is expected to use charges compatible with billions of non-Apple devices. Bloomberg's Alex Webb joins me with the details. Alex, why are Apple doing this, finally? They're under a certain amount of duress. Mm. The European Union basically has said that there has to be a standard for charging, and they are forcing everyone, essentially, who makes electronic devices to convert to USB-C. That's the kind of, you know, long, looks like a sort of lozenge, but, you know, well, 
half a centimeter across. Yeah. Um, that is what Apple is going to adapt. Uh, that's ultimately also going to come to laptops. Little laptops will have to use USB-C. As I'm sure you have, any number of different cables to charge your mobile phones and smartwatches, whatever. That's obviously very wasteful. They're not transferable between different devices. That's what the U European Union is trying to close. And finally, Apple then has clearly said, well, rather than trying to come up with different supply chains for different regions, let's just give it to everyone. Do you have that, I, I've had that, that box at home just full of cables? And, and just the one well, box? Just, like, just get, get like rid of the box. Like, no, because we may need them, and I never need them. Um, what else are you looking for from this event? What other product launches are Apple, or do Apple have up their sleeve? Well, this is usually the time where they would show off a new Apple Watch. I think, look, as ever, the focus is always going to be concentrated on the, on the phone, right? Because that is the big revenue driver. So it's going to be, they talk about travel in the wanderlust in the, uh, in the release. Mm. Uh, look, we're going to be keeping an eye out on, on our colleague Mark Gurman's reporting. He generally has very good previews and everything to expect. A little bit more in the, in the phone. It's going to be a slightly thinner bevel, which... You know, it may get some people excited, seems a little bit, you know, it iterative in terms of innovation. But, yeah, the main thing that people are talking about right now is the charging. OK, I'm surprised you're not more excited by the thin bevel, uh, Alex. Br briefly on, on how the demand for smartphones is holding up, because we've seen this reflected in the chip space, the commodity chip providers, at least. Is how, to, how badly uh, affected is Apple? And are they seeing anything of a turnaround in terms of demand for their iPhones? So the unit sales have not been brilliant. Apple doesn't actually break out unit mm. sales anymore, but inferring from some of the data, it looks as though unit sales haven't been good. They have been obviously e inching prices themselves higher. That's managed to, to you know, not ensure that the declines aren't all as significant as they might otherwise be. But crucially, of course, they've got the services revenue, which is increasing. And the services revenue is two parts. Of course, it is a higher margin business on the whole because it's basically software that they're, that they're selling or licensing. Um, and it, secondly, it ties people to their devices, right? So it means then that even if the next iPhone and the one after that don't have significant upgrades, it is way harder to justify trading that device in for an Android. So I mean, I'm just going to interrupt to say, yeah, arguably, as you're kind of illustrating, it's the services component arguably is a little bit more interesting right, right now for Apple. Um, Alex, thank you very much for the preview and the details around some of these functionality changes as well across Apple's products. I want to look ahead to around that event. Let's get to the auto sector now. So from smartphones and tech to the auto sector and the two blend to some extent. Mercedes-Benz is taking on Tesla. It's unveiling an EV with a longer range than any Tesla model on the market. Speaking earlier with Bloomberg from the International Motor Show in Munich, the company's CEO spoke about the strategy. Our goal is uh, value over volume. So we're not pushing volume. We're very, very careful about how we go to market, our go-to-market strategy. And as you can see from the results for the first six months of this year, that has been working quite well for us. We're focused on value for the customer. I don't think the customer expects from a Mercedes a little bit of a roller coaster ride, but something that you can depend on. Uh, so we will continue with the value over volume strategy. OK, Bloomberg's Craig Trudell joins us. He's been watching, of course, all the developments out of the auto show. There's been a lot, actually, on the docket and a lot of focus on some of the, some of the Chinese uh, automakers with a big, of course, concentration of EV makers uh, over in Germany and their plans to expand into the European market. Craig, let's start with the, with the Mercedes challenge to Tesla, though. How, how significant is, is Musk going to be quaking in his boots at this development? Or is it still part of a catch-up play for Mercedes? Well, just, just to piggyback off of what Ola Kalinius, mm. uh, what we just heard from him, I mean, the importance of this uh, CLA is that it's both value and volume for Mercedes, right? Where, where yes, they're, they're going to price it at a, at a point that's above the Model 3, especially where Model 3 has been trending. Uh, but they are going to do a lot of volume of that model uh, relative to, you know, uh, some of the, the higher priced, uh, bigger electric vehicles that they have brought to market already. And so it's a really important model. I do think if you're Musk, you're not necessarily quick in, in your boots uh, just yet in the sense that it's not going to be to market until the first half of, of 2025. But certainly it, it's a compelling product and, and a lot of uh, specifications that, you know, if they can hit those numbers, uh, absolutely make that product attractive relative to to what uh, Tesla has to offer. Yeah, and it's a, it's a really good-looking car. And so we'll have to see. Maybe this is a, this is a step change uh, for yep. Mercedes in terms of how, how, how they compete with Tesla and others in the EV space. What is, what is your take of the offering coming through from China with its EVs? How consequential is this? Can they really finally churn out and develop market share in Europe? 
I think it's really interesting. We, we uh, in our setup piece, uh, thinking about the Munich show, we called this the least German German car show, mm. uh, just because the amount of, of Chinese companies exhibiting this year uh, double what we saw two years ago when the show was last in Munich. And so, you know, absolutely, we know that they're they're at the show in force this time around. In terms of volume, I think what we're, we, we've been seeing is actually a, a reluctance on the part of most brands to come in with vehicles priced uh, you know, in the same neighborhood of what they've been offering in China. And I think they are sensitive to the fact that you know, if they come in here and crack a lot of heads, that it, it's going to you know, really raise some eyebrows among regulators. And, and uh, we know that this is a very sort of nationalistic industry, particularly here in Europe. And so we're seeing, you know, the, the products that has managed to win market share in, to a significant degree in China price much higher to where, you know, we'll, we'll see how much of an impact they have in the near term. What, what else has stood out to you from, from this event? I think BMW, uh, the Neue class uh, concept that they have, it's a very similar story to what we saw out of Mercedes, uh, you know, a, a sort of entry level sedan in the BMW lineup that's going to be really significant, uh, similar to Mercedes coming in 2025. So a bit, bit off in terms of uh, time frame, but that's going to be really important. And it's really sort of out there in terms of look. I don't know that it'll be for everybody, but it's certainly unique and, and different from what we've seen out of BMW. And I think uh, in terms of the, the Germans, I think it's a bit of a, a disappointing show if you're, if you're VW. There's mm. uh, sort of you know, warmed over concept uh, concepts, uh, you know, uh, the ID7, uh, to their credit, is uh, headed to production, but we've seen that at CES. We saw it in Shanghai earlier this year, so uh, not a whole lot on the VW stand to get excited about. Despite their huge portfolio of products yes. and, and, and brands and models. Okay, so nothing that really sizzled from VW. Um, thank you very much, Craig Tudor, walking Thanks. through some of the key developments across the auto space. And of course, we've been speaking, Oliver Crook has been speaking to a number of the executives on uh, the ground for us and bringing us the highlights from that event. Coming up, more from Germany's biggest auto show, Nikolai Setzer, the chief executive of tyres and auto parts company Continental. That's going to be interesting in terms of the inflation story and supply chains and China as well in terms of demand for their products. That interview is coming up next. Just briefly checking in on European equities as we look at gains holding up at three tenths of 8% across the European benchmark. Futures in the US, S&P E-mini is pointing up to just a gain of about a tenth of a percent. NASDAQ futures up two tenths of a percent. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets. I'm Tom McKenzie. Now, Germany's biggest car show is underway in Munich. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook is there with the CEO of tyres and auto parts company Continental. Oli. That's right, Tom McKenzie. We're joined now by Nikolai Zetza. He is the CEO of Conti here at the Munich Auto Show, originally known for its tires, and now really sitting at the center of where hardware meets software. They have an announcement today of Google, uh, with a partnership with Google. Tell me a little bit about that. So, you know, we are using artificial intelligence as well on the tire side since long in product development, in production, in testing. And now we are bringing AI, generative AI, together with Google, with our high performance compute into the car so that the consumer can interact intuitively with those functionalities which Google offers already today as well outside of the car. So in terms of concrete, because we talk about AI and it stays very abstract for a lot of people, how is it going to affect the car for me? If I buy a car you know, in five years, how is AI going to change my experience of that car? You can talk to the car, you can ask every question, you get an answer, which might be on your travel, where I am, what can I do, what, what is the next trip, how are my tire pressure on the left side, is there any issue, where do I find what in my car, so you have the partner once you want it. And this partner learns over time. They learn how you speak, what you're doing, and as long as you want to share it, you can share it. So using the total environment of the car, as well using the internet, you're always connected via the cloud, you're there. So you make it somehow your living room or wherever you cruise, it's all combined and merged. Right, and that's stuck sort of further into the future of the auto industry. Right now, when we're talking about sort of how the outlook is looking, there's a lot of pressures on the auto sector and on the economy more broadly with rising interest rates. How are you seeing sort of order flows? How do you see the sort of moment for the next few months rather than the next few years? 
I mean, still for this year coming out of the pandemic, the global vehicle market is growing by 6%. So you would still say that is a solid growth coming from a certain level. However, we see right now with other technologies here, it's not so much anymore about the volume of the car, it's about the value which you deliver. So there is more and more technology, more value, more innovation coming into the car. We just need it for sustainability, smartness, and assisted driving. So the future is relatively technical. And you, see, and you touched on something, because there's really two transitions happening right now in the auto sector. There's the EV, the electrification. We tend to conflate that with also the digitalization of the car. But the EV, as we know, is a lot less complex. A car requires a lot fewer parts, something that really you stood in the center of. How are you adapting your business to that new, that new simpler EV model? It's simple on the powertrain side, yeah. yes. And we spun off our powertrain business, by the way, in 2021. If you look for other auto products in EV, still has lots of hardware, four tires, for instance, which are getting more sustainable, which are getting more smart, and which are getting more technically. And software, software increases, independent of the powertrain, by the way, but electric cars offer as well opportunity, electric brakes, for instance, brake by wire, which will come as well here. And in particular, the complexity there on the software of the, what the user functionality can use, this is growing day by day. When you look at the biggest sort of growth areas regionally, what are you seeing right now? What is the biggest sort of growth opportunity for Conti right now? As I mentioned, there are some preconditions that everybody has to do, such as sustainability, making the world a better, better place. That's what we are striving for. And there it's in particular the smartness, assisted automated driving. So we offer there our sensor suites. We are going in cooperation with chip makers. And we're working further and we announced, for instance, automated driving for level four trucks. Being in the US, having hub-to-hub -hub tracking, which we can, auto together with our partner Aurora, automatically steer. So those are new growth opportunities, you might say, on the one hand. On the other hand, they're making the world better because it's much more efficient to drive 24 seven on those highways, steered operationally safe via our common system. And you talked about the spin-off of the powertrain business. Conti Tech, you're looking at perhaps spinning that part of your business off. Explain to me sort of that and how that fits in in your strategy. I mean, first of all, we have reorganized Conti Tech, focusing on industry, and we have generated via that an own, basically, to be independent part of original equipment solutions within Conti Tech. What we will do later on with this is not decided yet. So we review best ownership, how can we develop in the right way? Do we find partners if we need them? Like I just mentioned on the chip side or Aurora part, we are open in the ecosystem to find and make each piece of our company better. If we see that we are the best owner, of course, it stays with us and we are more than happy to develop it further. All right, and a lot, one of the big themes here has been a lot of the Chinese automakers that are really making, in some ways, their debut in Europe, really trying to get in front of the European clients. And eventually, if they want to get serious about selling cars here, they will have to establish factories and manufacturing. How do you think Continental can capitalize on that when as these Chinese automakers come into the European market? In the meantime, we are since several decades in China and our business with Chinese OEMs has grown over time and more and more functionalities, products of us are getting into Chinese OEM vehicles. On the other hand, as you mentioned, we have a global footprint. We have a strong legacy in Europe and in the other markets. So if those are coming into those markets where we have legacy, where we have an offer, we are more than happy to serve them with our knowledge on the R&D side, homologation side, as well as with our footprint. So there might be an opportunity, be our guest, we're here. Right. And so I was reading a note that UBS put out on Friday, which really gave a sort of stark appraisal of legacy automakers and said they would also affect the supplier side of it, really because a lot of these Chinese uh, EV companies make a lot of their things in-house. Is that a concern that you think about? Is that, where does that go into your thinking? At the end, we are used competition. We have so many competitors in the market and we are competing as well with in-house development, production or whatever. If we offer more value, they will come to us and we are more than happy to offer our products. If others can do it better, be it in-house or another competitor, then we have to get on our toes. We have to go into the fitness gym and come either with more competitive products or with more technologies and values to offer. So for us, it's just, just we are to the new reality. adapting to the new reality, exactly. And the future of the car, let's go a little bit more abstract, a little bit further out. You know, for me, from what I hear from all these executives and from, we see a lot of tech companies here, the future of the car seems to me it's closer to the iPhone mixed with your living room. Help us dream a little bit about what the future of mobility looks like. I already mentioned the living room before. I cannot more than agree. And that was consumers want. They wanted to have it more comfortable. You see as well by far larger screens. So there's large displays. 
which you have the feeling it's an entertainment on the one side, on the other hand, it helps you with assisted driving, obviously, getting comfortable, safe to your area, more sustainable, so the car is becoming more an intuitive part. It's less going from A to B. Yes, you do this, but you do it in an environment which you enjoy, which is safe and sustainable. And with that, do you think that there's going to be less car ownership, more of a sharing economy? Where do you think that, about that in terms of the future of automotive ownership? We have seen during the pandemic that individual mobility and owning individual mobility was an important part for the individuals. How this goes further in the future, will it be more shared or not, remains to be seen. However, this period has proven that individuals, and this was across on the globe, really value having an own individual mobility device, still using as well others, so it might be a mixture. How it will be remains to be seen. And I think we all remember when he got our driver's license, drove a car for the first time, the sense of freedom. I've been asking every CEO I've spoken to, what was their first car? What is the first car that you drove that you learned to drive on? Uh, for me, it was a scooter, which I did first because I had not enough money and could afford another car. And then it was a smaller car, and I developed myself towards the upper side. Okay, great. Well, that's the Conti CEO, Nikolai Zetzer, who's joining us here from the Munich Auto Show, really ground zero for the Battle of the Bev. I'll send it back to you. Wait, hang on, Ollie. What was your first car? My first car was a 1993 Volvo station wagon uh, in fire engine red, wow. and I will tell you, it is still running today. Love it. Fire engine. That's a big car as well. Ollie Crook on the ground for us in Munich. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent coverage. We appreciate it. In the next hour, Polestar's CEO will be joining Ollie with another really interesting interview as well. An electric vehicle company, of course, owned by and part of the Volvo brand owned by the Chinese company G. Lee. Coming up, ECB President Christine Lagarde says the euro area is in an environment of too high inflation. Well, we know that, but there's been a few more details from her speech, which lead up, of course, to that all-important announcement and decision from the ECB. And it's going to be very tough, that call, on September the 14th. We're going to have more as well from Jeanette Garrity of Robertson Stevens Wealth Management. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets. I'm Tom McKenzie. Let's get more analysis then on this global economy and start with the jobs picture. Let's bring in Jeanette Garrity, Chief Economist at Robertson Stevenson, Stevens Wealth Management, joining us now from San Francisco. Jeanette, thank you for joining us. As you thank pass you. the data that came through on Friday from the jobs picture stateside and look at how you tie that into your view in terms of 2024, how is it informed? where you think the economics of the U.S. will be in 2024 and the resiliency or fragility that's coming through now from this jobs market? Uh, it's it's, it's uh, resilient, but it's pretty much doing, I think, what the Fed here in the United States wants it to do, which is to slow down some and come back into, in the famous words of uh, Chairman Powell, better balance. Uh, that question about 2024 is an interesting one mm. because the the issue that we're looking at here is, uh, despite a very strong job market that is keeping personal income up and therefore fueling spending, uh, there still seems to be a pattern of consumers um, uh, consuming off of what we're calling excess savings, higher levels of savings in, in bank accounts. And most of us expect that that excess, such as it is that's there, will not be a factor going into 2024. It'll, it'll have disappeared. So it will be very much dependent on the job market and continuing to be strong in 2024. Um, I, I think it will. I, what economists do is, is often when they don't see a recession, when they expect it, they kick the can down the road. They say, well, it's coming, you know, and it's going to be out there. Um, it will, a lot will depend on uh, whether the U.S. economy can continue to weather, as it has thus far, these higher interest rates, because I do expect those interest rates to stay high well into 2024. Well, in the, and in that environment of higher for longer rates, where do you expect the pain point to, to be most acute? Is it corporate balance sheets? Is it a mm -hmm. need to reissue debt? Is it, is it indeed the consumer? Is it the real estate market? Is there an area of this economy that you're particularly focused on in this higher for longer rates environment? 
Uh, you kind of named them all. Um, uh, in particular, I think here, what we're all very focused on is, is commercial real estate, because there's a great deal of refinancing that needs to happen over the next couple of years. Having said that, a lot of that refinancing would be uh, beyond 2024. Uh, so we're watching that carefully uh, because also of the impact that that has on the banking system, on regional banks, which are holding a lot of those loans. So the big question there, uh, housing continues to be of great interest. Uh, we're now at a definite pay point in terms of mortgages here in this country, uh, and mortgage applications have fallen substantially, but home prices have held up. There's still tremendous demand there and a shortage of supply. Uh, I think my biggest concern is, is actually, you know, kind of... Uh, anything that is highly leveraged. So it's hard to pin that on one sector, uh, mm. whether it be a consumer or in a business sector. It's kind of everywhere you look, uh, companies or individuals that have um, uh, have positioned themselves to be extremely dependent on debt, it's going to be tough. It already is tough. So the growth that we're seeing and the employment growth we're seeing right now in the United States is happening despite the fact that there are already those pain points out there. I just think they're not going to go away. Jeanette, when you, when you, when you switch focus to Europe, and, and of course the dollar plays a role in this, and we've had some lines crossing from the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, just in the last few minutes, talking about the inflationary impacts across the Eurozone, saying the ECB will achieve a timely, and of course question marks over what timely means, a timely return of inflation to 2%, that the Euro area is in an environment of too high inflation. When you think about the European Union and this apparent determination from Christine Lagarde and certainly others on the ECB Governing Council to continue with higher for longer in the euro area. How concerned are you about the health of the eurozone economy? We're seeing the fragilities come through from Germany. Uh, yeah, and it's interesting that you mentioned Germany because Germany, I think it's it's both the it's both um, the the weakness in the domestic market, but but also what's going on in China, and, and we should talk about that at some point. But. Uh, Europe is in, a, is in a similar but different place than the United States. So I am I do have, I guess, some concerns. Uh, we still see the same pattern of uh, actually very strong uh, consumer spending in certain areas. But overall, the growth rate is clearly lower than what we're seeing in the United States. And mm -hmm. um, the fact that inflation is still high, and then you have uh, uh, an economy like in Britain, which has its own set, of, of issues which are which are dramatically different than a lot of other places with, with great economic weakness and mm. and great concerns on the inflation side. It's going to be in a bit of a different place in the United States. Uh, no surprise in what Christine Lagarde said. Um, a very yep. strong coordination among central bankers to fight inflation. Uh, just briefly before we let you go, Jeanette, that, that take then on China, and there have been a flurry of measures in the last few weeks. Are you becoming more convinced that maybe China as a growth driver will come back in the fourth quarter of this year? Uh, it, it, <laughs> it is. It, uh, they're, not, they're not posting, per se, negative numbers. It's just their version of a recession, which is not meeting their expectations. The, the growth is there. But, but I actually think that this... Uh, uh, the slowdown, this uh, what they would call stagnation, these economic problems domestically are going to continue because I do not think that the, the Bank of China or the government is really going to do much about this situation. Uh, if they had, if they were, they, it would have happened already. Uh, so I think this is a new environment for China and for the world, uh, a much lower growth rate, uh, a higher mm. domestic unemployment and and problems in getting domestic demand up. I think that's going to be with us for a while. Well, I think isolating the short term from, from the longer term is really important. And, and, and you put your finger on, on what many people now think about China and the trajectory of growth there and the challenges. Jeanette Garrity, Chief Economist at Robertson Stevens Wealth Management. Thank you very much indeed for the analysis and the take on the US economy, the Eurozone, and of course the input coming through from China. We're going to get you live pictures now of the President Biden, of course, as he marks Labor Day. Guess what? We can listen in briefly. He's there in Philadelphia America has the best celebrating the Labor Day. That's a fact. And as you can hear, honoring You guys America's ought to workers. talk about it more. It can take four to five years.
to train as an apprentice. It's like going back to college. The jobs are constantly changing. The technology evolves. You have to keep stepping up. You have to get more training. You can't, you, and you, so you can't be the worst in the world. You're the best in the world. No, I, I really mean it. You know, uh, like the sheet metal workers who used to use hand-drawn blueprints to design ductwork in buildings. Now use sophisticated computer-aided design systems so the entire project can be laid out in 3D. It ain't your father's sheet metal workers. This is a different world, man. You do the job right and you do it on time and you cost less for the, the guy you're doing it for. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets and to geopolitics now. In Ukraine, President Volodymyr Zelensky has announced his most significant wartime cabinet shake-up yet, replacing the country's defence minister, Oleksiy Reznikov. It comes as Kyiv wraps up, ramps up an anti-corruption crackdown and continues its counter-offensive. Bloomberg's Maria Tidow spoke with Zelensky's chief diplomatic advisor about the cabinet moves earlier today. Minister Reznikov has done a very good job uh, for about more than 500 days of the war time. Uh, you, you, you see that Ukraine is now gaining um, the, the, the arms, it's gaining the support, it's gaining the ammunition. This was not happening, unfortunately, before the open aggression of Ukraine and immediately after the open aggression of Russia to Ukraine. Um, only after several months, we started to receive in, a, in a numerous amounts uh, this, what we are hearing now, and that's what allows us to 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 have made already several major counteroffensives and now right you are we are having another very important counteroffensive uh, which is which is going on as it goes on i mean this is not a hollywood movie uh, you, you you cannot do it within one day but very important this is going on so the president is making his decision he has absolutely right his chief military commander of the country so we are hoping that the uh, tempo uh, of the counteroffensive uh, will be uh, increasing and definitely Ukraine needs to achieve very significant results in the near soon. And, and Mr. Shavko, just to end on this uh, subject, uh, of course, a, a counteroffensive, the defense ministry is important for a lot of the contracts and supplies, but it really is the generals that handle the operation on the front line. Is this going to have any impact on the counteroffensive, do you believe? And I wonder, too, uh, your foreign minister, Mr. Kuleba, last week, he was very uh, open about what he believes is uh, too much criticism, everyday commentary on how this uh, counteroffensive is going on. And he said, again, it doesn't play on Twitter time, it's happening in real life, and critics will be proven wrong. Do you feel perhaps there's too much negativity about uh, this counteroffensive? Well, uh, again, like you said in the beginning, I'm not directly involved in the planning of the counteroffensive. That's up to the military people and the generals you mentioned. I don't think there will be any any significant changes in the in the in the in the uh, uh, relations uh, on the on the military field, uh, on the military field amongst the military commandment. Uh, you know, criticism uh, is always at place. Uh, Ukraine is a democratic country, and you know, you are a journalist yourself. You know how journalists uh, like to. to to go into any single detail to criticize sometimes for the slow pace sometimes that uh, something is not happening let's leave the pieces and the particularity of the uh, counteroffensive to the people to the professionals when the result will be in place and the result will be definitely in place you will be first to see and command and to commemorate uh, the victory of ukraine Okay, Bloomberg's Maria today are there speaking with Ihor Jovka, the chief diplomatic advisor to Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky on the operation on the ground, of course, the counteroffensive by Ukrainian forces and that decision uh, by the Ukrainian president to replace his chief military head. Checking in on these markets, European markets are currently holding on to the gains of the day this Monday, gaining three tenths of a percent, so still on course to snap three days of losses for European stocks. The sentiment, positive sentiment coming through from Asia and from China in terms of the stimulus response measures and also increasingly an expectation that maybe the Fed is positioned to pause at its next meeting, lifting European sentiment. US futures pointing higher by about a tenth of a percent on the S&P futures. Labor Day holiday, of course, closed. Markets reopening on Tuesday. Euro dollar at 107 and Brent gaining three tenths 
tenths of percent at close to $89 a barrel. Coming up, Catherine Avery, CEO and President of Catherine Avery Investment Management, joins us with analysis. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. I'm Tom McKenzie here in London. Let's check in on these markets then. European stocks holding on to gains for the Monday, currently up three tenths of a percent across your sectors. Top of the list, technology uh, gaining uh, close to one percent in terms of sectors. At the bottom of the list, insurance currently down four tenths of a percent. So that's the benchmark move higher by three tenths of a percent across Europe on hopes that stimulus may be starting to run out of an effect now coming through from China and the policymakers in Beijing and an expectation that maybe the Fed has the room to pause at its next meeting. US futures currently at 4,526 on the S&P e-minis pointing to just modest gains of about a tenth of a percent after the best week last week since June. Euro dollar at 107, a gain there of a tenth of a percent for the single currency yields, by the way, in terms of Eurozone sovereign debt moving higher in the session. The debate continues, of course, amongst ECB officials leading up to that September the 14th decision. And Brent crude, close to $89 a barrel, again, a four-tenths of a percent. Worth noting as well that for the context, you've seen upside of plus 20% since the end of June for oil. That's a brief check on your markets. Let's get more analysis now then from Sophia Hortari Costa from our Markets Today team and Noor Al Ali from Bloomberg M Live joining me now. Great to have you both for the take on this. And Sophia, obviously you bring that expertise on China. I want to start with that because there has been this sentiment across equity markets today. You saw it pronounced, of course, in Asia and then the follow through to Europe that maybe, maybe some of these granular piecemeal measures that come through in the last few days and weeks are starting to, to, to have an impact and there is a bit of optimism. Talk us through whether you think that's going to be sustained. Yeah, and, and Tom, why this optimism today versus Friday mm. when the measures were actually announced? It's the evidence that we got um, over the weekend in China that people were actually rushing out to buy homes. I just want to uh, bring you this just to show how busy it was for property brokers um, in, in Beijing. Ho existing home transactions doubled on Saturday from the prior week. Uh, and in Shanghai, the number of new home transactions in one day was equal to all of those in August. So essentially, uh, state media propping this up, really highlighting this. And Tom, you know that when Chinese state media highlights this, then it's something that clearly um, local authorities want to highlight. You know, this is working. People are actually going into the property market, not just new homes, but also existing homes. Um, and really, th there seems to be a little bit of a sentiment shift because if if this really does happen, then there's a fall through, a fall, fall through across the consumer sector. So we will get consumer spending again. There's a sense that retail sales may actually not be as bad. And then, you know, China's economy will actually kick into gear. So is this the time to get finally, to finally believe in the stimulus measures and that they're working through um, ch uh, China's economy? Markets seem to think so. Too. And I think you highlight a really interesting point, which is of all the policy measures, it's the first time the rhetoric, the policy measures being announced, it's the first time we've seen material behavioural change exactly. on, on the ground. So the next point then is, are we watching, in terms of to maintain this and sustain this, what do you think is going to be more important? Is it the data that comes through or additional policy measures? I do think we need to see hard data. And you saw, Tom, the impact that those PMIs that were better than expected, even though it was on the manufacturing side, not services side, that really started the conversation last week. You know, when you and I were, were talking on the show that, you know, actually Actually, China's economy may be better than feared. And if we do see a, a kind of follow through, um, see these policies work, I think that will really kind of change. That could really uh, change sentiment. But I think markets still want more. I think markets are constantly calling for more stimulus from China, um, especially kind of outside the region when there is a little bit of a misunderstanding. Why does China kind of not just throw more mm. stimulus at the economy if it has all these levers it can pull? Uh, I think you make a really good point that it's just using the kind of old lever of the property market again, uh, which is not the most sustainable way to grow your economy. But again, it's what it's what markets might might want to see. You're seeing that feed through to the commodities market. It's 
it's good, obviously, for the UK stock, stock market, given its dependence on China. And I just think it feeds into that mood that actually the global economy will be fine and, you know, and we'll get those central bank pauses after all. So, yes, I, well, I, it's a good start to September. And you, and you, tee, you tee up Noor Al Ali uh, very, very nicely indeed. Noor, let's bring you in at this point then on, on the question about central banks, on the question of central banks. Uh, uh, do you think mark, are markets right to be kind of sidelining another Fed hike, at least for now? Have Fed officials seen enough to be able to have the confidence to pause at the next meeting? I mean, that's an excellent question, Tom, right? Because we are starting to see signs that, in fact, the labor backdrop appears to be cooling. And that really adds to the discussion here and the calls that we've seen recently um, from big wakes, you know, from BlackRock to PIMCO, really talking about now is the time to really jump in on those short end yields. But, I mean, mm. we I, I take you back to what Powell said at Jackson Hall. They are on a meeting-by-meeting -meeting approach. They are data-dependent. And so they're going to need to see um, a bit more consistency in this data, uh, especially after the summer uh, seasonal data or the seasonal hype goes away. Uh, unfortunately, we won't get that before September. We know that the Fed is going into its blackout period next weekend. And so I think this gives the markets room to run with that momentum that we're seeing. Uh, and though I do point to you as well, that although, you know, it is a U.S. market today, but I'm looking at um, Treasury note futures, uh, and those are trading today, and you are seeing, you know, those prices really falling through, though, or, you know, following in line with the footsteps with uh, the, the European debt or the European sovereign debt market. So I do anticipate yields to push higher uh, in the session tomorrow to at least catch up with those European mm. bonds um, in the run-up to the uh, blackout period. Nor do you expect that to be a relatively short-term short, short -term move? I, I have to give a hat tip to, to Mark Cudmore from, from our MLive team on his call last week that you want to be buying the two-year U.S. Treasury at this point. He thinks that yields have probably peaked. And then, of course, we have BlackRock, as you mentioned, coming out with their call that maybe there's a screaming buy at the front end of the yield curve. Do, do you kind of align with that view? Is there the next level in the sand? Are we looking at 4.5? What, what are you looking at in terms of the yield curve? Well, look, that's an excellent question. You bring Mark Cudmore. You know, I'm in that team, and we've had these discussions. Mm. And you also, I mean, I want to point out that Venram is on the other side of that spectrum as well. So it's a live mm. debate, right? And when those lively debates come in, especially with the markets coming after the summers, that's really going to shape the narrative for the rest of the year. Now, I'm of the opinion that, you know, the Feds, if you look at the real policy rate, it could potentially be uh, sufficiently restrictive for them uh, to maintain or hold rates at where they are. I don't anticipate cuts to come in as soon as possible. And I also want to point, actually, we've had some notes as well from JPM, you know, the equity analysts there, talking about the complacency that we're starting to see in, um, in the stock market as well. You know, and if you compare it with uh, real yields and, you, and the, the, the valuations that you're starting to see in, in the U.S. stock market, you'll see that they're, they're quite lofty. So it's either that real yields uh, are, are, are meant to follow through those valuations, which is not really likely, or that we're, we're about to start seeing valuations uh, being downgraded as well. I, you know, it really depends. We've seen the U.S. market really maintain itself strength and quite resilience throughout the year. Now you're starting to see the labor market just starting to show mm. some normalization. So I do anticipate that you really can't go against the momentum trade as we've seen throughout the summer. But at the same time, if the data starts pointing towards something else, that's not going to stop the Fed from continuing on its path to fighting inflation, which is what they've repeatedly said. Yeah, the risks of finding that momentum trade, uh, as you say, and maybe the concerns around complacency uh, in, in the equity market. Sophia, let's bring you back in and tie in the geopolitical line on this. And there's been some fantastic reporting from our tech team over in Asia on Huawei, where they actually serviced or at least got a company of investigators to break apart the latest Huawei phone. And I think the, 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 lead, the top line being that these US sanctions, and of course Huawei was one of the first targets in this, have been maybe less effective than maybe US officials w w would have hoped. What's got your kind of takeaway in terms of the ability for China to adjust to these restrictions and what the Huawei story tells us in terms of the geopolitics, geopolitics uh, between these two nations? This is a fascinating story, yeah. Tom. I mean, I, I think 
the, the fact that SMIC, that, so that's the chip maker that's powering these Huawei phones, both mm. Chinese companies, of course, uh, both um, restricted in some way by the U.S., the, the fact that they can produce advanced chips, a lot more advanced than perhaps the U.S. had anticipated, so soon after those sanctions were imposed, for me, this suggests that actually people are underestimating China's capability to catch up to technologies. Again, this is not the most advanced technologies that the U.S. has access to, so that China is still uh, in some ways behind, but it's taken a lot less time to catch up. So the fact that the U.S. is trying, there's kind of leading a global campaign, it's not just the U.S., it's also its allies, to uh, kind of cut off China from the most advanced technologies, um, will that even work if China can make these technologies within China? So we don't know how advanced these are, how cheap they, they, can, they can be made and at what kind of scale and volume. Um, but we do know that this, at least this smartphone is, is a lot more um, sophisticated than people had, had perhaps anticipated. It's selling mm. quite well. It will sell quite well in China. And it's powered by a Chinese chip. So and, and, yeah, and suggestions that maybe that window has closed to, to around five years in terms of the most... Uh, cutting edge part of these part of these chips and, the, and that sector. Thank you, Sophia Horto Acosta, with the context, of course, on the measures that come through from China, the implications uh, for these markets. Nora Ali, of course, from our Bloomberg M Live team on this rates environment and the next steps for these central banks. Coming up, we're going to have more on the markets with Catherine Avery, the CEO and president of Catherine Avery Investment Management. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Trust is probably not the word I would use. Uh, we need to see action. And until we see action, there can be no trust. OK, that was U.S. Commerce Secretary speaking, of course, Gina Raimondo, about her visit to China in an interview on CBS's Face the Nation yesterday. For more, let's bring Catherine Avery, CEO and President of Catherine Avery Investment Management. Catherine, thank you for joining us. What really stood out for me from Gina, Ram Gina Ramono's visit was this line and her warning to her Chinese counterparts that China was becoming uninvestable in the eyes of some U.S. executives. I wonder how you think about the geopolitics and the risks around China as you position in the months and years ahead. Well, I, I think going ahead, the real question for us and what, what it really means to the U.S. equity markets is China's ability to get back on its feet economically. Um, as you mentioned before, mm. it looks like they are, we're seeing some good improvements in the Chinese housing market. And, that, and that's good, I think, on all fronts for us here in the U.S., because, you know, China doing much better gives us much more confidence here. And that China has a lot of exposure and a lot of U.S. multinationals. It's good for, for, for U.S. profits here as well for our companies in the U.S. Yeah, indeed. So the importance, of course, of seeing China enact those policy measures, and certainly Europe is very exposed as well, of course, to what happens in China. Back in the U.S., though, or at least switching focus back to the U.S., Catherine, are you concerned there's been some warnings again about the complacency in these markets? U.S. Uh, equities, of course, had a bit of a rough August, but last week was a, was a pretty decent week for U.S. stocks. Is, are, are U.S. markets looking through some of the concerns, some of the risks, and is there complacency? Complacency, I would say yes. When you take a look at the valuations on the market, yes. At about 20 mm. times this year's forward earnings, yes, there seems to be a little bit of complacency. As you mentioned, we came off of a very tough August. People were concerned about Jackson Hole. They were concerned about China. Um, but coming into September, we got some, some decent numbers from the jolts. We got, we got a nice um, employment number, which was all good news you know, for, for the doves out there. But, um, you know, our expectation is about that these numbers are not going to be a smooth sailing going forward. You're going to see a lot of discrepancies where we have pockets of strength in the economy, pockets of weakness, whether or not the inflation numbers continue on that downward trend. So far, it's looking like that. But I will caution, you know, in July and in August, we did see an uptick uptick in energy prices. And now, if, if China does come online with that strength, we're going to conti probably continue to see energy prices rise. However, um, with that, mm. I, I think that there are some places in the market that you can really take a look at to, to either that have, that have to catch up or to help ride you through those waves, because we have really, what we've come through 
has been an earnings recession, I believe. Okay, uh, we we do think yeah. that the. That consumer will probably hang in there. We're not going to see um, um, negative um, GDP numbers, but we had that in the in the um, in in the earnings numbers in the past. Um, but as those inflation numbers start to come down, they're going to start working the, themselves into the profit margins of companies and into better earnings into next year. But where the caution so, comes is that. Go yeah. ahead, Tom. No, I just the, the warning on on the earnings recession is 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 really pertinent, of course, and so that leads yeah. me to, to to the follow up question, which is how do you which, which parts of this equity market are most vulnerable to that earnings recession, and where are you finding resilience and companies able to maintain margins? Right, consumer consumer is definitely one of those areas that we would be very cautious on. Um, we would stick to uh, sectors where. Um, there is opportunity for the profit margin expansion, like in what we would call staple tech, technology that works within the overall ecosystem um, of the growth sectors, but you're not paying up for the stock prices. For example, like a Broadcom or an Oracle, where they're trading at 50% discounts to their overall sector, but you need the chips from from Broadcom and you need the software support from Oracle to be able to create that AI ecosystem. And you're getting a dividend and you're getting strong dividend increases. So cash flow is really important. It's going to be all about, you know, valuation, cash flow, dividends and yeah. and um, what and quality. You know, also so that so that is that is the rationale for for overweight being overweight staple tech and a lot of those characteristics Catherine will be reflected and are reflected in the energy sector we've been dissecting yes. uh, the moves higher in oil uh, on on the on the show today do you right. when you look at the energy sector are you seeing some of the similar similar characteristics is that another area where you may want to lean into uh, in the weeks yeah, and months that, ahead. That's another area, yeah. That's another area that we are overweight in at this point in time. And given the fact that energy prices have increased um, in July and in August, we haven't really seen that reflected in the stock prices. Um, Chevron's a great example of that. Um, you know, we are, we're seeing inventories are starting to draw down. We haven't replaced the strategic reserves. China, if, mm. if we can continue with the, the good news that we're hearing out of China, you're going to start to see energy prices continue to rise. I mean, they're already at a high for this year, but have not yet hit the highs um, that we've seen over uh, the 52 weeks. So continued up. Side surprises in the price of oil will be good for these companies and area and, and stocks that have not participated in the overall uh, market run that we've seen so far this year. Okay, Catherine Avery, CEO and President of Catherine Avery Investment Management. Have a fantastic Labor Day and making the case there for how to position in a more volatile uh, environment with a preference for energy and staple tech. We really appreciate your insights and taking some time out of your holiday. Still ahead, we are going to head to Germany's biggest auto show, back to that auto show where the Polestar CEO Thomas Ingelath joins us next on their latest lineup. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Okay, welcome back to Bloomberg Markets. The other story we are watching, thousands have been left stranded in the remote Nevada desert after heavy rains turned the Burning, Mad, the Burning Man Festival into a mud pit. Festival goers were told to shelter in place and to conserve food and water. The music and arts festival taking place more than 100 miles from the nearest major city. Festival goers who usually only have to saddle battle dust storms were left wading through ankle-deep mud and facing contamination from failing toilet facilities, with some opting to make the seven-mile hike out of the festival by foot. One death has been reported. However, police have not confirmed whether it was weather related. Right, let's turn now to our coverage of the IAA, the auto show in Munich. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook is standing by with the CEO of electric car maker Polestar. Ollie, take it away. 
That's right, Tom. Thank you so much. And like, thanks for joining us on Bloomberg TV. We have the CEO of Pulsar with us right now. You had really spectacular growth last year, almost doubled your volume, some 80%. What are you seeing for this year? Can you keep that kind of rate up? Well, look, our um, prediction for this year with deliveries around 60 to 70,000, of course, that's still great, great growth. But clearly, 2024, two new cars in our portfolio coming. Of course, that will be an, an, even, an even bigger potential for us to grow. Yes, that's a, that's a great story. And then in terms of the sort of macro headwinds, we've seen a lot of questions around rising rates, about demand slowing in China. How are you seeing that affecting the, uh, the demand picture? Well, at two elements in that. On one hand, generally, the, the switch to electrification I mean, whatever you see in nuances, there's a very clear path ahead over the next year. So, I mean, the midterm, long term, you know, us just participating in that swap, I think it's, it's that great story. Now, thank God Posta is actually set up as a company in 27 markets. And that, of course, being set up in 27 markets helps us a lot to balance out. Yeah, you always have locals up and down certain legislation in one country coming in coming out i mean there's an inconsistency in what kind of um you know what ev support electrification gets and we can of course through this broad footprint level it out to a great extent and we've seen a lot of new competitors to europe a lot coming from china do you think the field is getting a little bit too crowded well <laughs> not as a surprise i mean yeah. obviously it was always clear that um there will be the, the competition will catch up. There will be as well the OEMs um, coming with um, ele electrification of their fleet. And back to your question before as well, we have our very clear setting of knowing that we will be that premium luxury brand and that is the focus that we have. And yeah, there might be lots of brands coming, but a lot of them are just simply addressing complete different markets. For us, the competition is clear. We have there a company Porsche, which we want to, you know, be an electric alternative. And that premium luxury segment is not that much conquered yet. And how helpful is it that you come from sort of Volvo, an established European brand? A lot of these companies are showing up and trying to just get attention for the very first time. Well, to, again, there's one thing about just trustworthiness of course being a child of volvo gives us a lot a lot of credibility and customers knowing that safe product is as well valid for polestar on the other hand um, it's as well the knowledge about what you have to do to be successful in the market it's not that easy it's not just simply you know pop, popping up and opening uh, a, a shop the depths of understanding, especially here in Europe of the European market, where each and every country has their own legislation and they have very, very different needs of customers for financial um, um, options. That is something that I think we managed in the last years very much to invest into. Well, Thomas Engelent, the CEO of Polestar, talking about the challenges of expansion into the EV race. We're here at ground zero of the Battle of the Bev in Munich. Ollie on the ground for us in Munich. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic work. Now we're going to have more from the auto show with the head of the European division of Chinese automaker, Neo. That's coming up. European markets currently pairing some of their earlier gains, just up a tenth of a percent. NASDAQ futures up two tenths. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets. I'm Tom McKenzie here at European HQ in London, checking in on your European markets. And the optimism that had pervaded at the start of the trading session has faded. And it looks like we will be ending the session either flat or possibly in the red for European stocks. The benchmark currently flat, as you can see, at 458. There had been early optimism given the handover from Asia. A very solid print coming through from the Asian session. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index ended up a little over 1%. And it was a strong session in Hong Kong as well on the back of stimulus measures coming through from Beijing. But the optimism, as I mentioned, has faded here in Europe. Yields also ticking slightly higher across the yield curve over in Germany. 3% on your two-year. That's a move higher by two basis points. 
slightly more pronounced over in Italy. BTPs yields up four basis points on the front end at 372 on the two-year. Euro dollar currently trading at 107, just a gain of about a tenth of a percent. $88, close to $89 a barrel on oil. Prices remain elevated. You've seen a gain of about 22% since the end of June on Russia cuts, of course, and expectations from traders that Saudis will extend their cuts into October. Currently, Brent trading at $89 a barrel, just gaining three-tenths of a percent. And U.S. futures flat on the S&P E-minis as you look ahead to the restarting of trade on Tuesday, given the Labor Day holiday stateside. Nasdaq futures looking slightly healthier, pointing to a gain of two-tenths of a percent. Across your sectors, worth flatting here in Europe, travel and leisure at the top of the list, gaining seven-tenths of a percent. Technology is also in the green, gaining six-tenths of a percent within that sector. Bottom of the list, utilities down seven-tenths of a percent. Insurance is also off by around six-tenths of a percent. That's the sector breakdown then, again, on a slightly more muted view now and optimism that has faded, as I said, across the European session. Worth flagging as well what's happening in the commodity space. We touched on oil, but copper and iron ore. Price is now coming off for both of those commodities, despite the impetus coming through from China. And you saw a pickup in home sales in cities like Beijing on some of those cuts to the requirements around down payments and mortgage interest rates. Let's get back to what's happening on the ground in Munich now. Our coverage of the IAA car show, which has been comprehensive, led by Oliver Crook of Bloomberg, who's standing by with another important executive, Chris Chen, head of EV maker NEO and the European division. Ollie. That's right, Tom. We're very pleased to be speaking to Chris Chen here, who's the head of uh, NEO here in Europe, which is one of the uh, car makers that's really pushing into this European market and really trying to establish itself. So you've launched in Denmark, you've lost in, launched in Germany, Netherlands, Sweden. What have you learned most about the European consumers and what they sort of are asking for the EVs? Yeah, the uh, European consumer is a little bit okay, different from China, okay, but not, not that many uh, different from uh, Chinese users. Actually, they care about the, uh, the vehicle quality and also durability. They care about the uh, vehicle performance so in terms of the dynamic and the driving. And, uh, but they, uh, they are less concerned about the uh, digital or the uh, space of the car. So actually, we see a little bit of differences. And also, when we get to this market, actually, uh, there are a lot of the regulation stuff we need to uh, take care of. Like uh, if you want to introduce the digital companion in the car, it's no me, you need to care about the uh, data privacy. So uh, this is also something that uh, European users will care about. I see. And there's also the question of building brand awareness. For a lot of the companies coming into Europe, maybe not as familiar, how do you build more brand awareness in Europe to really get that volume up? Yeah, we actually, uh, we are doing businesses that's different from the other brands, okay? First, we're doing the direct sales business, okay? We don't use the dealers or distributors. All right, we'll do everything by our own. And the second is that we try to introduce the uh, ecosystem to Europe. Uh, this ecosystem includes the car, the end-to-end -end services, and also the digital uh, systems, and also the uh, beyond the car lifestyle part. So actually, uh, we introduced our uh, chargeable, uh, swappable, and uh, uh, upgradable power system into Europe. In the meantime, we also build a lot of the uh, new houses. It's fancy with the galleries, with the clubs. People can enjoy a good time in the new houses. We uh, bring all of the elements to the Europe. Okay, we try to do this, all right, to build up, uh, to shape our brand a little bit. And what kind of volume would you like to be doing in Europe, you know, in a year or two years? How many cars would you like to be selling on the, in Europe? Yeah, actually, uh, the first year we launched in Norway, which is, okay, September uh, 2021. And uh, we sold over 1,000 cars in Norway, just one model, which is the ES8. Okay, large uh, ES8 and uh, six and uh, seven seaters uh, SUV. And uh, this is a very good result. Actually, we're ranking number two in terms of the uh, uh, segment uh, share. And uh, we're launching the, another three cars in Europe, in Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, and also uh, Denmark, including uh, Norway as well. And uh, because you know that we're introducing a, a high prim premium product, okay? Our product starts from the 60K euros in Europe. So we're not looking for a fancy, okay, a great number of the uh, deliveries. But uh, we try to uh, be the uh, maybe top four, top five, premium brand in the market. And do you think that manufacturing in China can service that delivery? Or do, have you started to think about maybe where you would begin to produce cars here in Europe? That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, you always need, need to uh, look at the economy uh, uh, model for the uh, local manufacturing, mm -hmm. right? For now, we import the cars from China. We have uh, enough capacity in the factories in China. And we import the cars. We pay like a 10% of the import tax. 
But uh, in the future, if we okay, uh, can uh, deliver more cars, like uh, maybe 5,000 or 6,000 cars a month, then uh, we can reach to the economy uh, level to uh, build up some local plant, like a SKD plant or the uh, purely local manufacturing. But that's going to be in the future. And then I also want to talk to you about your home market over in China and really the price war that's underway there. Do you think that that will spill over into Europe? How do you see that affecting the market for EVs? I don't uh, see okay, too much uh, price pressure. Uh, actually, uh, people always pay for the uh, good product and uh, good services. We build up our cars okay, based on our, our uh, smart uh, platforms. And this platform is uh, scalable, upgradable. And uh, we also provide the, the good services, okay? uh, the worry-free charging services and also worry-free after-sale services. So people is willing to pay this much to get that uh, value. So uh, I don't see okay, uh, a lot of fears, competition uh, in terms of pricing, okay, just as uh, we see in China market. Actually, I feel so far uh, comfortable about that. And so one of the big complaints about EVs, generally speaking, is oh. how expensive they are. Not your EVs yeah. in particular, but it's certainly a concern in uh, Europe and, and, and around the world, particularly for you know, so the higher-end vehicles. Um, you, sort of, you have an interesting sort of subscription model, and you, also have, you can also sell batteries sold separately to a large degree, where you rent the battery yeah, yeah. and yeah. you own the car. How, yeah. are, how is a European audience finding that? Uh, you know what? Okay, there's one figure uh, because we choose to uh, sell the uh, chassis and the batteries separately. Okay, you just need to buy the uh, chassis, and then you can also subscribe to the batteries. That can uh, ease a lot of worries from the users. Okay, whatever. Okay, in the future, that uh, battery is got updated according to the new technologies. Then uh, I still stick with the current batteries, right? So there are a lot of benefits. The current figure, this we call it the bus battery as a service. Okay, the take rate is over 98 percent. So uh, almost all the users choose to uh, 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 purchase or subscribe the car uh, from the bus. Interesting. So almost all of your sales, so-called, are basically the, the batteries sold separately. And so, do you, so, so that's interesting. So you think as the battery density, for example, it, it improves, then you're not wed to a single car with a single range. Actually, you're going to be able to boost the range on your car as that technology improves. That's right. Okay, actually, we are managing like a two, uh, two uh, batteries capacities right now, 75, 100. You can always okay, subscribe to a 75. Right, it's lower price, and uh, whenever you want to okay, go for a long trip, then uh, you, of course you can subscribe for uh, 100 for just one month. Yeah, this is and, flexibility. And, and in terms of building the infrastructure for the battery swap, because this is another quality that really differentiates Neo from other EVs, you can swap out the battery, so the recharge time, it's none of that sort of long waiting around. How is building that network out, and how's the European audience found that? Uh, we have already built uh, 26 okay, power swapping stations in Europe. And uh, actually, I, uh, I actually drove from Amsterdam to uh, Munich okay, really? from, on Saturday. Actually, I stopped at the three power swapping stations, okay, just try to uh, test a trial, okay, the new uh, swapping technologies. Then uh, the, uh, it just takes like uh, five minutes for a battery swap. So, okay, you really save you a lot of time. Time is precious. So uh, we're going to build more power swapping stations. Imagine the future, okay, the highways, okay. I think the total mileage for the highways in Europe is only like uh, 44, 43,000 kilometers. So uh, if we arrange like uh, every 200 or 250 kilometers of power swapping stations, can really, okay, ease the worry from the people to take a long journey, right? Thank you so much, Chris Chen. You're the uh, CEO of uh, um, <clears throat> NEO here in Europe, or the managing director, running the operations here. Really one of the other Chinese competitors, really coming in, trying to build their awareness here, and really changing with a slightly different model from many of the others here in Europe. OK, Bloomberg's Oliver Crook on the ground for us in Munich from the IAA Mobility Car Show, of course, in that German city. Coming up, oil prices steady. They're around $88 a barrel now on Brent after rallying in the past week. Following Russia's announcement, it will extend export curbs. Nadia Martin Wigan of Svealand Capital joins us next with her take on these oil markets. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. We are seeing signs of strength in the oil market and momentum as OPEC Plus leaders plan supply cuts. Let's get the forward-looking analysis then with Nadia Martin-Wigan, director at Sfleeland 
Capital. Nadia, we appreciate your time today. Get us your view then on where and what the drivers are for this oil market. Are we looking back? Are we looking now towards the end of this year, possibly at reinvigorating, reviving that forecast around $100 oil? It's possible. You know, the, mar the market has been super negative on oil, and we've had net longs, you know, going into the summer when, when we look at mm. speculative positioning, super negative. And now we've seen things start to change, but especially in that physical market, right? That's where we're seeing tightness. That's where we're seeing the bullishness expressed. Having said that, when we look on the speculative side of things, we see very little investment having come in yet. So that means that we're at, you know, almost $89 a barrel, and the bulls aren't in yet. So if they see signals that they need to get in, we can absolutely see those kinds of numbers. However, you know, we're still waiting to hear what Saudi Arabia is going to do for October. Are they going to extend their cuts, their voluntary cuts of a million barrels per day or not? And how do they see the demand picture? So we need to see what's happening with this very next leg first before we can talk about year end in terms of an official forecast. OK, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot to unpack there, Nadia. If you had to take a guess now and throw a dart at the dartboard, where would, you, where would that land in terms of that decision by the Saudis? We see space for additional barrels to come back in right now. However, the market is expecting them to extend the cuts, right? So I think right now the balance is towards them maintaining the million barrel per day extra cut. Um, if they don't do that, I think the oil price will come off a few bucks. But it provides an opportunity to see if demand is really there and if inventories are drawing and how the export quotas, for example, out of China, you know, we expect exports of refined products to go higher, how that actually plays out versus the entire macro picture. However, I think right now the Saudis are more likely to continue to hold the course uh, for the next month. And you talked about that, that industry-wide capex drought. What changes that? Is it a price level? Is it regulation? Uh, is it the inflationary dynamics, wages, labour? What is the trigger that's going to get more investment in terms of capex for this industry? Well, I, I think in the Q2 reporting, actually, on the shale side, we've actually seen that uh, production guidance is going higher. So whereas it kept being flat or expectations kept going lower, I think we've hit that kind of price level where there's a little more confidence on the shale side in the very short term of the cycle because the market expects OPEC to continue to toe the line alongside Russia and maintain a very tight market. So as this starts to come up in terms of higher expectations on U.S. production, I expect that you know, forecasts are going to rise 200, 300,000 barrels per day um, by year end on U.S. production, we might start to see some questioning on the side of OPEC. OPEC, of course, is investing in the sector already, you know, in, in terms of rigs and all of that, that sort of things. It's the rest of the world that has been lagging behind that. So we are at a bit of an inflection point in the U.S. now, I think. And what are you looking at in terms of China and its demand? Is it the refiners or is it that domestic demand? Is it travel? Is it airlines? Or is it the refiners that's going to be so consequential in the quarters ahead in terms of getting a clearer picture, a clearer drive in terms of China's demand? In the very short term, refiners, of course, make a difference. And we have seen increased buying um, by some of the Chinese uh, you know, uh, refiners. Having said that, when the announcement came on Friday that there are going to be higher export quotas, and it was 12 million uh, tons of additional quotas were issues. 10 million was the expectations. We didn't see tanker rates rally. We didn't see the market reaction that we saw last year. So that suggests there's a little bit of hesitation in terms of what is actually needed and where the internal demand is sitting right now. In general, I think the market you know, continues to be quite bearish on China in the general macro picture. So it's all viewed with skepticism when it comes to domestic demand. Well, is that, is that bearishness, is it justified when we look at iron ore, Nadia? I know you have a view on this as well. 115 is the price right now. And I'm looking at basic resources as a sector just in today's session here in Europe, up five tenths of a percent. Can we expect that the demand for iron ore picks up as some of these measures are pushed through for China's real estate market? Yes, we can. But again, I think we have to think about where the market is positioned right now. We see a lot of analysts mm. calling for much lower prices on iron ore. Right? And that is where we see a bit of a floor at 
500, because that's when we see production cuts coming in. So we think we're in a healthy range. There is absolutely upside to come. But when we set it against the negative demand picture on China, oil prices, iron ore prices, and copper prices are all extremely strong. And they're in a comfortable range. So there's not a reason to be alarmist. OK, Nadia, smart analysis. Thank you for breaking down some of the dynamics in this oil industry and oil market and a look there as well in terms of iron ore and how it ties into some of these policy measures coming out of Beijing. Nadia martin Wing, director at Svealand Capital. We appreciate it. Coming up, it has been a tough year for the UK property market. But Morgan Stanley, well, they're a little bit more optimistic. We'll have more on their call around UK property. That is coming up. This is Bloomberg. You're watching Bloomberg Markets. Welcome back. Morgan Stanley analysts are calling UK property stocks a value play. Analysts said, quote, we are alive to the fact that broader UK exposure and offices as a subsector are out of favour. But at current valuation, the risk reward is compelling. Well, let's bring in at this point then Kit Reese from our equities team. Kit, talk to us about some of the pressures on the UK property sector. How have those property sector stocks, have they performed year to date? And what are some of the challenges that the sector has faced? Sure, sure. It's been a really, really tough sector to be in this year. They've really underperformed the UK property stocks. So the FTSE 350 Retail Investment Trust Index is down 8% mm. versus the FTSE 350, which is about flat on the year. You know, there's been some very negative data points. We had the nationwide report um, saying that UK house prices fell the most in 14 years. The Bank of England saying there's been a fall in mortgage approval. So it's been really bad. It's not been great, um, mainly due to the high interest rates, as we all know about this, um, you know, getting people hesitant and to buying a new property, but also putting pressure on refinancing, maybe on companies going to pursue these big projects and also on the debt that they currently have to service. So it's been a sort of a mix of lots of issues which has really put pressure on these is that, is that, As you say, that multi-pronged impact of rates, whether it's the domestic, the, the buyer of residential properties, mm -hmm. whether it's homeowners looking to refinance or the, or the companies themselves with those debt loads. What is Morgan Stanley's rationale then for mm -hmm. turning positive on this sector? What are they seeing that maybe some in the markets are not? So and the broader view of their broader view on UK stocks, they're saying that you know they're looking kind of like a value play now. So the valuations have got so low that maybe it's time to take a look at them. They also say on the UK specifically that they're, they're positive on the fact that these companies don't have such high debt levels as maybe some of their European peers. And you know they also see said that the balance sheets are adequately um, capitalised. So this is all really positive, especially for some sectors such as office real estate, which has really struggled, been struggling with things like work from home dynamic, you know, the push pull between workers and employers trying to get them back in. Um, and also just, you know, these companies wondering to do with these tower blocks um, that, you know, might be standing empty. So it's quite an interesting, maybe slightly contrarian view for Morgan Stanley on this topic. But yeah, there seem to be a few positives now for the UK at least. Yeah. And as you rightly point out, the balance sheet line from them, and that's consequential not just for the sector, but more mm. broadly for the, for the UK economy as well, that the, the, the relative resilience of real estate sector or real estate company balance sheets here in the UK, mm. as uh, at least analysed by, by Morgan Morgan Stanley. What are some of the other catalysts that, that you're looking at then? Is it all about the BOE and where the central bank goes with, with rates or are there other factors at play to, to focus on in, in, the, in the months and quarters ahead? I mean, I definitely do think that it's about the, all about the BOE. Yeah. And we've got um, the meeting later this month where people will be watching that and the inflation report just before on the 20th of September. So these are going to be super important. We've seen the sector react really strongly in the past when in July there was a slightly softer reading. You know, the sector went up a lot. And then I think people are just, investors want to see whether these trends can be sustained. You know, are we seeing uh, inflation easing a bit or is it still going to come in hot? And then will we see more interest rate heights? So this is going to be super, super crucial for the sector going what forward. What is your sense of where the views land, whether it's Morgan Stanley or others, in terms of residential property versus commercial and office? How divergent are those two paths now? 
So it's, that's a really interesting question because I've seen, you know, over the course of our coverage, analysts being mainly quite bearish on the sector overall. So we had HSBC, I think it was back in July, they cut 11 stocks um, because they basically see, you know, all these issues persisting. There's also questions over, you know, net asset values falling, those kind of issues. Um, there's been a little bit of kind of talk over certain areas of office, maybe in the West End, looking a bit brighter. Mm. But overall, it seems a kind of, you know, broad-based negative Activity. But, you know, the stocks have fallen so much. You've got British land, the likes of Derwent, London, down over 20% the year. So maybe, you know, some investors will see a bit of value and a bit of opportunity. Kit Reese, thank you very much indeed. Really excellent. And you can read that, of course, on the terminal and on Bloomberg.com. The valuation opportunity, that's the Morgan Stanley call, at least, around UK real estate. Briefly checking in on your markets right now. We've given up the gains leading up to the close here in Europe that had been posted earlier on in the session. You're flat across the stock 600, the European benchmark. U.S. futures, S&P E-mini is pointing down by about a tenth of a percent for when trading restarts on Tuesday after the Labor Day holiday. Euro dollar at 107, easing off on the gains we'd seen earlier in the session for the single currency. Brent at $88 a barrel, sniffing 89, up four tenths of a percent. And across your sectors, travel and leisure is leading the charge in crores of the, the upside you're seeing across European equities as a sector up seven tenths of a percent. Bottom list, insurance down seven tenths. But again, broadly across these European markets, it looks like we're going to be closing out a fourth straight day of losses. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.